Okay, so surely one of the purposes of pure mathematics is to discover the connections between seemingly different looking kinds of subjects to find these kind of universal patterns which lie behind things. And the fact that we can make these kind of bridges between these different looking theories is one of the reasons that we feel like we're on the right track with the way that modern mathematics is set up. And I don't think there's any example of connecting different looking subjects that's more profound than the idea I'm illustrating with this triangle. Because in this triangle, you have these three really important subjects. Logic, which some would call the basis of thought. Category theory, which is one of the most powerful languages we've ever created. And type theory, which gives us this ability to formalize mathematics and put it into computers. And one of the most amazing discoveries of recent times is that, in a sense, all of these three subjects are exactly the same. Okay, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it is certainly true that, that the ideas in any one of these subjects can be translated and considered in terms of the other subjects. Okay, so think about these things as three sides of the same coin. Now, there's many different names people have for this lovely kind of discovery. Some people call it computational trinitarianism. Other ideas like the Brower hating Kolmogorov interpretation and the Curry Howard Lambeck correspondence are basically kind of mathematical ideas pointing in the same sort of direction. And really the point is that if we focus on these subjects and how to translate between them, it's just extraordinarily helpful. Okay. Um, and there's lots of reasons for this. One of the main reasons is it helps us to understand, okay? As people who are interested in mathematics, we know a bit about logic. We've been playing around with logic for a long time, right? So the fact then that all of the goings on in logic have interpretations in terms of these other subjects means that we can get loads of understanding about these other subjects for free, right? Just by translating the things we know about in logic into these other areas. Another consequence of this is that if we sort of build up our knowledge of category theory and type theory, then we kind of get a theory of how to prove things and logic. And I, I mean, you know, general logic, intuitionistic logic, which is like a generalization of classical logic. We get an understanding of that for free as well. Okay. So there's a tremendous sort of amount of economy in this. It's it's sort of exploiting symmetry in a sense, okay? It's the idea that if you have some big structure, but you know that there's symmetry there, then you only have to focus on a part of it. And once you understand that, so you can just use your understanding of symmetry to sort of uh, get automatic understanding of the rest of the thing. So this is all very, very pleasant. So how does this relate to what we're gonna talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about logic. Okay, so I'd like to illustrate sort of where we've been in this course and where we're going as a sort of journey. I often think that understanding mathematics can be thought of well as a sort of journey. You know, maybe you're sort of moving around in some category where the objects are theorems and the arrows are proofs and you're sort of wandering around in this kind of uh, category of knowledge or something. And so I think this journey metaphor makes sense. And I would say that we started in the first video at set theory, okay? And then what we've done is we've moved to category theory. And recently we've been focusing on these ideas of universal constructions. Essentially, we've been gathering these tools that we're then going to apply to understand lots of other things. And now what we're going to do today is we're going to be moving towards logic, okay? So we're going to start with some pretty simple ideas to do with logic, true and false, not, and, or, and so on. But we're pretty quickly going to be getting into some really, really interesting kind of material. And we're gonna be looking basically at how these ideas, these kind of ideas of products and co-products and so on, can be interpreted in terms of logic. And this is really going to be giving us this sort of correspondence, or at least the first kind of hint of this correspondence between logic and category theory. And we're going to arrive at 
the idea of a hating algebra and of the idea of intuitionistic logic, which is really getting us sort of on the way to talking about type theory, which we're going to be getting into in the next video. So I believe that the topics we're going to discuss today are really important. I think that logic itself is very important, but, but I also think that understanding this connection between logic and category theory is so extremely useful for all sorts of things to do with mathematics. So I hope you enjoy. Whenever we're talking about mathematics, we're talking about what's true, and we're sort of implicitly using logic. And um, there are some mathematicians who they get so used to writing proofs and all the rest of it, and they're using logic all the time, and then they don't actually study logic directly. They just sort of take it for granted that they understand the basic ideas. And I think this is a mistake because if you look at logic directly, you will see that there's a really quite a rich structure there and it really enhances your sort of quality of thought to focus directly on the ideas of logic. But we're going to go much further because we have this amazingly powerful category theory machinery. And we're going to turn that on logic. We're going to generalize logic and we're going to really understand logic in a much wider kind of context than is usually understood. And this is also naturally going to lead us to type theory, okay? So um, lots of things come together now. So let's start with the idea of classical logic, and I'm just going to introduce it in a fairly rough way to begin with. So the idea is we might have a statement, for example, I am in a room, and that statement can be true or false, let's say. Now it's surprising actually, when you look at many statements from everyday language, you can sometimes pick holes in them and, um, you know, if you want to be pedantic, for example, what if I'm um, stood halfway inside a room and outside a room, or what if I'm in a house which is being constructed, what does that mean? Um, is this true or false? But anyway, nits picking aside, we can say that this is a kind of statement which um, is either true or false. Um, now, what do we mean when we say that something's true? And what do we mean when we say something's false? It's a good question. I would perhaps say that um, we sort of know what these things mean in relation to other kind of ideas in the world. Um, but that's me. Maybe other people have other ideas. Um, but um, we're really going to understand something about the meaning of truth and falsity uh, in this video. But we're really going to start by thinking about the sort of logic of our everyday language. So this is the idea of a statement, which might be true or false. And uh, we could give this statement a name. We could call it X. So X is this statement. And X is true or false. It turns out I am in a room, so it's true. And since we're going to be writing true and false quite a lot, um, I will at least temporarily just abbreviate them. I will use a T for true and an F for false. Okay, fine. So there's various different things we use in our language um, to do with logic, things being true or false. And I want to try and define those a bit more rigorously. Now I want to say right off the bat that this sort of logic that I'm going to start talking about, this kind of classical logic, is not the only game in town. The idea here is that a statement that we're going to talk about might be true or false, but there are no other possibilities, we assume. And it turns out that you don't have to play such a limited game. You can actually generalize logic, and we're going to look at this later. And we can think about kind of more general um, sort of kinds of logic where statements might not just be true or false. So-called intuitionistic logic which can be more general. And that's 
sort of like intuitionistic logic is to ordinary logic what like non-Euclidean geometry is to Euclidean geometry. It's a generalization of the classical constrained theory. Anyway, let's start with classical logic. So there's various words that we use in classical logic. We've already encountered true and false. So false means not true, essentially which leads us on to our next word, which is the word not. What does the word not mean? Well, you can really think about this in terms of functions. Okay, so here we have this set of truth values. So it has two values, true and false. And we might as well call this set omega. Now let's understand what this word not means. And we can actually think of not as a function. So here is not. So not true is false and not false is true. So if I say, I am not a woman, we could maybe make that a bit more mathematical by saying, um, not I am a woman. Now, I am a woman for me is false. So this would be not false and that would be true so it's true that I'm not a woman okay um, so you see that this not we can basically think of it as a sort of um, negation or like a sort of function which flips around two elements okay which is Really quite interesting if you think about it. Not is this sort of, not gives us this sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between these truth values and these truth values in the same set, but it's not an identity function. Okay, so now we get on to the idea of and. So what does it mean if I say I am holding the red chalk and I am holding the green chalk? Well, it basically means that it's true that I'm holding the red chalk and it's true that I'm holding the green chalk. When I say A and B, that means precisely that A is true and B is true. Hmm. I'm using the word and again. OK, well, let me um, explain it using a diagram then. So say we have these true values X and Y. So each of x and y is a value in omega, an element of omega. It could be true or it could be false. And um, when we say x and y, sometimes we write this like this. x wedge y. And, um, and the thing is that we can really think of this wedge here um, as is often the case in mathematics, here it's what you might call, this is what you might call infix notation, because we put this wedge in the middle of two symbols. But really what we mean here is that this kind of and operator is something that takes two truth values in and then returns a true value. So it's better in some, in some uh, scenarios at least, to use this kind of prefix notation where we're sort of thinking of this as a function so and we can think of it as a sort of function that takes in two truth values and then returns a truth value so and we can think of it as a function which takes in two truth values and returns a truth value and so how does this function work well true and true is true Right? If, if my first statement's true, if x is true, and if y is also true, then x and y is also true. So 
this function here and it sends true comma true to true. However, in all of the other cases where either x is false or y is false or they're both false, in those cases the statement x and y is false, right? So false and true is false, false and false is false, and true and false is false. So okay, let me do an example. Let's say that it's true that I'm holding the red chalk, but it's not true that I'm holding the green chalk. Now, is it true that I'm holding the red chalk and I'm holding the green chalk? No, because that corresponds to this point here and doing and, doing this and function, evaluating it on that point here gives us false. In fact, the only thing that this function sends to true is this point true comma true. In other words, x and y is true if and only if x is true and y is true. Okay, so here's the next idea in basic logic, and it's the idea of or. And again, or, we can think of it as sort of like an operation that takes in two truth values and gives us another truth value. So for example, if I say I'm holding the green chalk or I'm holding the red chalk, what that means is that at least one of the following is true. That I'm holding the red chalk or I'm holding the green chalk. And if neither of those things are true, then that statement, I'm holding the red chalk or I'm holding the green chalk, is false, okay? So, or, um, we usually write it with this sort of V symbol, and again, we can think of it as a sort of operation that takes in two truth values and spits out another truth value, so it's a function from omega times omega to omega. And um, as you can see, it's defined here, so that um, each of these values is sent to true, except this one, false, false. Okay, so if I'm not holding the red chalk or the green chalk, then the statement I'm holding the red chalk or the green chalk is false, and otherwise it's true. Okay, so the final sort of basic logical operation which we want to talk about is this idea of implies. So if I have true values x and y, and I say, x implies y. What that means precisely is that if x is true, then y is true. And so when we say x implies y, we can write it like this, x big arrow y. And once again, we can think of this big arrow as something like a function that takes in two truth values. So we can write it with this kind of prefix notation and think that big arrow is a function from the product of our set of truth values with itself to itself. And here is an illustration of the function. Now, um, this implies function can be a source of confusion for some people when they're learning logic. Um, so a good way to think of it is um, as something like a promise, okay? So think about the statement, it's your birthday implies I will give you a present. OK, that's like a promise that if it's your birthday, then I will give you a present. So let's think about when that promise is kept and when it could be broken. So if it is your birthday, but I don't give you a present, then that promise is broken and it's false that if it's your birthday, then I give you a present. On the other hand, if it's not your birthday and I don't give you a present, the promise is not broken. Um, in a sense, the notion is vacuous, but in that sense, we say it's true. We say that it's true that, you know, this idea that if it's your birthday, then I give you a present, that holds true if it's not your birthday, irrespective of whether I give you a present or not, because that has nothing to do with the promise. It's not broken because it's not your birthday. So. The fact that I didn't give you a present is not something that you can um, hold that promise over me about because I promised something that would happen on your birthday. And if it's not your birthday, then OK, you don't need to get annoyed with me. It's not even your birthday. OK, um, 
so there we go. Um, thirdly, if it is your birthday and I give you a present, then I've obviously kept the promise. And finally, if it's not your birthday, but I give you a present, again, I haven't broken the promise. It's not really what I promised about, but it doesn't break it, okay? So basically, X implies Y always holds true, except for in one case, which is the case where X is true and Y is false. And if that happens, then this statement that X implies Y is not a true statement, okay? So another way you can think of this is basically to say that Y is at least as true as X is. So that's great. We have all of these kind of logical words and we can string them together and we can make statements, um, statements involving variables. And we can see if those statements are sort of true universally or not. So here's a great example. Um, let's say I write this. So I say X and Y implies X or Y. Um, now, the question is, is this a true statement? And what do I mean when I say it's a true statement? Well, this at the moment has this kind of infix notation. And so if we take this, then we can express it in the sort of what I would consider the proper kind of prefix notation by taking this big arrow and moving it to the left. And we can do the same thing with this wedge and V symbol here. And we can basically re-express this as this sort of function here, this composition of these functions operating on X and Y. OK, so we pick the X and Y in here. This AND function um, gives us X and Y in this first omega here. This OR function gives us X or Y in the second omega function here. And then we're calling the implies function on those two things. And so when we ask, is this a true statement? We're really asking, does this function, this composition, send everything to true? Does it send every value uh, in this kind of source set to true? In other words, irrespective of which truth values X and Y we pick, is this statement always true? And it's actually a fact that it is, and you can verify this by just calculating this composition and noticing that this composition sends everything to true. And by the way, a sort of clever way to say that is that um, we can write this function as exclamation mark omega times omega, which is the function into the terminal object, followed by this function which just picks out the true value in omega. Okay, so this is where everything starts to come together. Um, so I want to talk about categories again for a moment, and then we're going to connect that with logic and pretty much all the ideas that we've been discussing so far are going to come together in a very pleasing way. Um, so the first thing is the idea of a pre-order. So to uh, introduce this, I want to show you one of my favorite categories, which is this one here, okay? Um, and the objects in this category are the natural numbers. So I've only done the first three, but they go on and on, of course. So we've got zero, one, two, three, and so on. And we do an arrow from any number to another number whenever the first number is less than or equal to the second one. So zero is less than or equal to one. So we have an arrow from zero to one. And we also have an arrow from zero to two because zero is less than or equal to two. And we'd also have an arrow from one to one. I haven't drawn that, but of course, one is less than or equal to one. And that would actually correspond with the identity arrow. So notice that I'm not saying anything about composition here. And in fact, I don't have to. Um, why is that? Well, the reason is because there's only at most one arrow from any object to any other object. And therefore, um, if I have any sort of composition of two arrows, 
then I know that that composition has to start where my first arrow started and end where my second arrow ends. And because I know that this category has the property that basically there are no sort of parallel arrows, there's, a, there's really at most one choice for this composition. So I don't really have to talk about composition except to say what the kind of source and target um, of that composition is. There's no um, sort of parallel arrows to have to distinguish between. Um, and that's really what a pre-order is. So if we define, um, say we have a couple of objects, um, let's say A and B in some general category, and if we have a couple of arrows, F and G, let's say we have these distinct arrows, so they're not they're not the same. Um, if we have two arrows and they both have the same source and they both have the same target, then we call these parallel arrows. And a pre-order is simply a category that doesn't have any parallel arrows. So this is bound. And when we don't have parallel arrows, everything gets so much simpler because we don't have to worry about composition. We know that the composition of this arrow here and this arrow here is this arrow here. So that's the only one that it could be. Um, so here's our definition then. A pre-order is a category with at most one arrow from any object A to any object B. And that's it. Now, if we have a pre-order, um, the normal way to represent it, because this concept actually came about before category theory, it's a kind of simpler version of it in a sense. Um, the way this is normally represented is we think, well, we have our set of objects and um, whenever there's an arrow from an object A to an object B, we usually write that as A less than or equal to B. And so the fact that there's an identity arrow for any object A could be represented by saying we always have that A is less than or equal to A. Um, and that, of course, makes sense numerically as well. And so in a sense, you can think of this kind of pre-order concept as some kind of a generalization of the kind of ordering that we get by thinking about numbers. Because we also have this so-called transitivity property, which says that um, if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to C, then A is less than or equal to C. Why do we have this? Well, this is just arrow composition, okay? Um, if there's an arrow from A to B and there's an arrow from B to C, then there has to be an arrow from A to C. And the presence of arrows in pre-orders is indicated by this less than or equal to symbol. So this, um, for us, we can think it's just a consequence of the presence of identity arrows. And this is just a consequence of the way we define arrow composition. So for us, who know category theory, a pre-order is just a category with no parallel arrows. And I think that's actually a much more profitable way to think about what a pre-order is, because we can import all our knowledge about category theory to really get moving very fast with these ideas of pre-orders. So I want to talk about one pre-order in particular that's closely related to logic. Um, and the idea is really quite simple. We take some set and then we consider all of the subsets of that set. In other words, all the sets which are contained within it. So a subset is just a set inside a set. Okay, so here we have this set here. Maybe we could call it X. And then we think about the different kind of subsets of this. Um, and so there are four of them. The full subset, this one that just has element A, this one that just has element B, and this one that has no elements at all. And then all we do is we sort of form a pre-order by thinking about which of these sets are contained within each other. So when one set is contained in another, then we'll draw an arrow. So 
every element in this set is an element of this set. So this set is contained in this set. So um, we draw an arrow like this. Similarly, this set here is contained and the empty set is contained in both of them. So we might want to um, label um, these arrows with this containment symbol here. So um, if we're going to be technical about it, um, when we have these sets X and Y, um, we say that uh, Y is contained in X, when every element of Y is an element of X, and that's sometimes written like this. But notice how similar this notation is to this kind of notation here, okay? Which is really quite telling because this is really indicating how we can form these kind of pre-orders by containment, okay? And they're very interesting to think about because these kind of systems, well, they're pleasant for lots of reasons, but one of them is that what's going on here um, is really closely reflected by some things in logic, as we're gonna see very shortly. But there's just one more kind of categorical feature of um, this sort of structure that I want to point out. And that is that, I mean, notice all of these subsets that we've picked, they're all distinct, okay? We haven't like taken two copies of this subset. And that means that this structure is not just a pre-order, it actually satisfies more conditions and it's something called a partially ordered set. So a partially ordered set, also known as a poset, is a special kind of pre-order which has an extra condition that it satisfies. And if we think about it as a category, then it's basically just the condition that we don't have arrows going in two directions between a pair of objects, okay? So if we have a pair of objects um, in our category, if we know that it is a poset, a partially ordered set, then we know that there can be at most one arrow going in any particular direction because it's a pre-order. But we also have this stronger condition that we know that there can't be arrows going in both directions. So basically, if we have a poset, then either there are no arrows from one object to another, or there's exactly one arrow going in exactly one of the two directions. Okay, um, that's what a partially ordered set is. And we can express this with our less than or equal to notation by saying that it's a partially ordered set where if um, X is less than or equal to Y, in other words, if there's an arrow from X to Y, and if Y is less than or equal to X, then that always implies that X is equal to Y. So whenever there are sort of arrows going in both directions between two objects, those objects have to be the same, all right? And we see that this is actually a partially ordered set by virtue of the fact that all of these subsets that we've picked are all distinct, okay? So here we are, this idea of partially ordered sets. And this thing here is sometimes called a posset of subsets, okay? So you can take any set you like, and then you can form this kind of category this partially ordered set. It has the objects as the subsets of the set you picked and an arrow from one subset to another whenever the first subset is contained in the second one. And you form these nice structures like this. And these kind of posits of subsets are very, very pleasant because for one thing, um, what's going on in situations like this um, really is reflected by some sort of ideas of logic, okay? So the next thing is we're going to think about that. Okay, so basically if we have a set X, we can form this kind of structure and we call this structure sub of X and it's this partially ordered set which has objects as the different subsets of X, including the empty subset and the full one. And then we have an arrow from one object to another when the kind of first corresponding subset is contained within the second corresponding subset. So these arrows are really representing the sort of containment. 
So this subset is contained in this one in the sense that every element of this subset here is an element of this full subset here. So clearly we have one of these sort of partially ordered sets like this for any given set. And these, tend to, and these turn out to have a really, really interesting structure. So in order to appreciate this more and how it connects with logic, we just need to think about one more idea, which is this idea of indicator functions. So we're interested in these kind of categories of subsets. And it turns out that they have some very, very interesting structure that we can use lots of the tools we've already learned about to understand. But there's also a fascinating connection between these kind of structures and logic. And the way that we get at this kind of connection between this stuff and logic is with this idea of an indicator function or a kind of classifying function or characteristic function. Now, the way this works is as follows. If we have a set X and we have a subset of X, so for example, this subset A here, um, then there's going to be one of these sort of indicator functions associated with this. And this maps X to truth values in such a way as to indicate whether elements belong to this subset A or not. Okay, so this is called the indicator function of A, chi of A. And if an element is in A, then this function sends it to true. And if an element of X is not in A, then this function chi of A sends that element to false. So think about, for example, that X might be the set of animals. And think about the statement, um, an animal is a cow, okay? In a sense, that statement is referring to the cows, okay? Because we can think of it like a function that sends every animal to either true or false, and it'll send all the cows to true and all of the animals that are not cows to false, okay? And therefore, we have this kind of way of representing the set of all cows in terms of a function which goes from the set of all animals uh, to either true or false in such a way as to indicate which animals are cows, okay? And so in general, having this kind of indicator function lets us shift perspective from this perspective, which is um, sort of quite spatial of having a sort of certain subset of our set picked out, to this kind of more logical perspective of thinking that certain elements are associated with, of thinking that certain elements are labeled true and other ones are labeled false, okay? So essentially this kind of indicator function, chi of A, we can think of it sort of logically like this statement. Is it in A, question mark? If it is, then this statement sends such an element to true. If the element's not in A, this indicator function sends that element to false. And conversely, if you make up any function from some set into this set of truth values here, that's going to be specifying a subset, the subset of stuff that your function sent to true. And so now with all of this in place, we can start to see lots and lots of connections with ideas that we've been discussing. And the first one is this. Let's say we have some set and we'll consider this partially ordered set. Let's suppose we have some set X and we'll again consider this kind of partially ordered set um, that has elements as subsets of X. So let's say we have a couple of subsets of X. A and B. And we're interested in when there's an arrow from A to B. Now we've basically already seen by definition that A is going to be less than or equal to B if and only if all right um, we say this if and only if quite a lot so I'm going to abbreviate it from now on 
I'm going to use the normal convention of writing if with two f's and that shorthand for if and only if. So a is less than or equal to b if and only if this subset a is contained in the subset b, like here, okay? Every element of this subset is an element of this subset. So if this one is called a and this one's called b, then a is contained in b and there's an arrow from a to b and we write a less than or equal to b because it's a poset, all right? Um, but now, thinking about indicator functions, we have an extra um, feature that this also happens if and only if we have that the indicator function of A implies the indicator function of B. And what do I mean by this? Well, what I'm saying is that this function uh, here, which we could also write if we like as... Um, big arrow chi a chi b this sends everything to true okay um, and so let's just draw out what this means so here's our set x and we have this uh, function chi a and that's indicating what's in set a and here's chi b That's indicating what's in set B. And then here is this producty pair, chi A comma chi B. And that's sending every value in X to a pair of truth values, with the first truth value indicating whether that thing is a member of A and the second truth value indicating whether that thing is a member of B. Um, And then after that, we do this big arrow, this implies thing, and that gives us something in omega. And what we're saying is that this thing is true um, if and only if this thing is true. What do I mean by true? I really mean true after exclamation mark x, all right? I mean, it sends everything to true. So in other words, this red composition here is equal to this composition where we send everything to the terminal object and then we send things to true. Okay, um, so this white function on the bottom just sends every value in x to true. That would be the indicator function, if you like, for the full subset of x where everything's in that subset. And this function here um, is another one. And basically, this red function, this composition, um, that's going to send an element to true um, when it's the case that if that element's in A, then that element's in B. All right. So what this is all saying, basically, is that it's true that A is contained in B precisely when for every element of our set X, we have that if that element is in A, then that element is in B. This is just exactly a sort of um, way of encoding the definition of what it means to have one subset contained within another. OK, so we're already starting to see that there's a sort of correspondence here between the logic and what's going on with these subsets. So, for example, if I say every cow is a mammal, that's a sort of true or false statement. But we can really translate it. Um, well, we can firstly express it logically to say that if an animal is a cow, then that animal is a mammal. But then we can also translate it into an expression about subsets. So we can say that out of a set of all animals, the subset of all cows is contained within the subset of all mammals. And um, it turns out that we can do something very similar with and. And this is really where we're going to see a lot of ideas start converging. So let's ask ourselves a question. If we pick some set X and then we make this posit of subsets, then this is a category, right? So why don't we ask, what does the product of a pair of objects look like in such a category? So we just have to remember the definition of a categorical product. 
In fact, a lot of the details are not so important because we're dealing with this kind of simpler structure of a partially ordered set. So many of the details of composition become irrelevant. Um, so basically, if we have these objects A and B, which are going to correspond to subsets of X, if they have a product, then that's going to be this object A times B. And it's going to have to be less than or equal to A because there has to be this projection arrow. And it has to be less than or equal to B because there has to be this projection arrow. And it has to have the property that for any object H, which also has an arrow into A and an arrow into B, there has to be an arrow from H into A times B. Um, we know automatically if there is such an arrow that it's unique because there's only at most one arrow going in any particular direction. And we know that it would make this diagram commute automatically because we're in a partially ordered set. So the definition of a product really simplifies quite a lot. So we say that A times B is going to be the product of A and B. When we have that A times B is less than or equal to A, A times B is less than or equal to B. And for any sort of similar H, which is less than or equal to A and B, we have that H is less than or equal to A times B. So there's a very kind of suggestive bit of terminology that people use to describe such a product. They'll often call it a greatest lower bound of A and B. Why is it a lower bound of A and B? Well, because it's less than or equal to A and it's less than or equal to B. But why is it the greatest such one? Well, because if we have any H, which is also less than or equal to A and less than or equal to B, then uh, A times B is greater than or equal to H. All right. Um, but now we can really see what the product of A and B really is. OK, because remember, if we're dealing with like actually this kind of definition works in any kind of partially ordered set. But in this particular one here, whenever we have less than or equal to here, we can rewrite that as contains. So we want that A times B is contained in A and contained in B. And whenever H is contained in A and H is contained in B, where H is some subset, we want H to be contained in A times B. So what is A times B then? Well, it's the greatest subset, which is contained in A and contained in B. And does that remind you of anything? What's the greatest subset, which is contained in subset A and contained in subset B? It's the intersection. So if this is our set X and this is our subset A and this is our subset B, then the sort of largest subset of X, which is contained in A and B, is this intersection here that we write as A intersection B. So now we see everything coming together. Um, so the intersection of a couple of subsets, A and B, we'll often write this as A cap B, and it's just the set of elements which are simultaneously in A and in B. So like this kind of situation. And so if we look at this again, we can see that this product here of A and B is nothing more than just the intersection of A and B. In other words, in this case, A times B is just A intersection B. All right, so read it again. A intersection B is contained in A, yes. And it's contained in B, yes. And it's the largest such thing. In other words, any H which is contained in A and contained in B is contained in the intersection of A and B. So it's the greatest lower bound of A and B. So maybe you start to appreciate um, what a powerful notion this idea of the categorical product is. It describes sort of the Cartesian product of sets. It also describes the idea of intersection. And it also describes the idea of and. 
And we can see that by using our indicator function to kind of shift from this sort of set theory perspective to the logic perspective. So my pet is a gray animal and a cat. So I could say that in terms of set theory to say that out of the set of all animals, my pet belongs to the sort of intersection of the gray animals and the cats. Um, alternatively, you can say it in terms of logic to say that my pet is a cat and my pet is a gray animal. All right. So basically we can shift between this kind of subset talk and this kind of logic talk. And in general, the indicator function of the kind of intersection of A and B, we can write it as chi of A and chi of B. All right, because this is just going to send something to true precisely when it belongs to subset A and subset B simultaneously. In other words, when it belongs to the intersection of the subset A and B. And so basically what we can see here is that all of this language that we're talking about to do with products and everything else, um, we think of it as describing things to do with subsets, but it might as well be describing things in terms of logic. Instead of having subsets here, we could think, well, um, these are sort of on or off. So in this case, both of these things are true. In this case, A is false and B is true. In this case, A is true and B is false. And in this case, they're both false. Um, and it's basically the same picture. But in this kind of alternative logic viewpoint, we're talking about statements and we having sort of and appearing here. Um, whereas in this set theory speak, we're talking about intersections. And that's why um, usually when people talk about um, partially ordered sets, they won't write this as A times B or A cap B. The common notation is A wedge B or A and B. All right, so we're sort of seeing this symbol now being used in two different places. Um, primarily in logic to really mean that statement A is to really mean um, sort of logical and. But I'm also telling you now that in general, when we have a partially ordered set or even a pre-ordered set, the product of A and B is usually written like this. A wedge B. Well, you see that basically all of this stuff is just different perspectives on the same thing. And I think the core of that idea is really just this idea of taking the product. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to see in a totally sort of dual way, we're going to see the emergence of the idea of unions and or and co-products. So you can maybe guess um, what's going to happen next. And if you have some inkling, I advise you to pause the video and see if you can guess the kind of other ideas because they're very similar to what we've just discussed here. It's just um, basically the same ideas, but with the kind of arrows working in the opposite direction. OK, so now we're going to ask, what does it mean to take the co-product of a pair of objects in this category sub X? And so the co-product, if we remember the definition, we better have that A is less than or equal to A plus B because we have an injection there. We better have that B is less than or equal to A plus B. And we better have that for any other H, where A is less than or equal to H, and B is less than or equal to H, we have that A plus B is less than or equal to H. So why are we calling A plus B the least upper bound of A and B? Well, you see with this notation, we've got that A plus B is greater than or equal to A, it's greater than or equal to B, so it is sort of an upper bound on A and B, but it's also the least such one, because if we have any other such thing, like this H here, which is greater than or equal to A and greater than or equal to B, then H is greater than or equal to A plus B. So A plus B is like the smallest thing, which is greater than or equal to A and B. 
Um, and then if you think about the kind of set theory version of that, think about what's the kind of smallest subset which contains A and contains B. It's the union, right? The union of A and B. That's the set of all elements which are in A or B, which is usually denoted with a cup like this, so A cup B, the union of A and B. That's the set of all elements which belong to A or B. And that's precisely what this coproduct is in this case. All right, so we can basically see that A plus B here is exactly the union of A and B. And once again, we have this kind of connection with the logic as well. Because if we take the indicator function of A union B, that's going to be sending an element to true precisely when it's in A or B. So the indicator function of A union B is going to be chi of A or chi of B. And so we also have this kind of logic version of viewing things. And that's why usually in the literature about partially ordered sets, the coproduct of a couple of objects is usually denoted as A, V, B, like that. So we're using this sort of uh, all notation here um, in the kind of literature about partially ordered sets. And the connections don't stop there. Okay, let's ask another question. This is very easy. What is the terminal object of sub of x? We're looking for an object in this category that every object has one arrow into, precisely one arrow into. What is that? It's the full subset. It's the subset that we could call x. All right. And what does that correspond with in terms of logic? Well, the indicator function or classifying function of the full subset is really just this function which sends everything to true, okay? If you're wondering why I'm writing it like that, um, then just draw it out. This is x with elements a and b. Here's the terminal object, exclamation mark x sends all of these elements to this element in the terminal object. And then this true arrow here sends everything to true in omega. And so this is really just fancy notation for saying the function that sends everything to true. All right. So in other words, the terminal object in our category is corresponding to the idea of truth, okay? The idea that everything's true. So let's just recap. We've got that the product corresponds with intersection or and. We've got that the coproduct corresponds with union or or. And now we've got that the terminal object corresponds with the complete subset or true. So what about the initial object? Does this category have an initial object? Well, yes, it does. And it's the empty set. The empty set is a subset of X and it's contained in every set, all right? And um, what's the classifying arrow of the empty set? Well, it's the function that sends everything to false. So the initial object corresponds with the empty set and corresponds with false. 
So isn't this amazing? All of these ideas of logic are all just falling straight out of this kind of theory which we've already got. And in particular, it's looking like sub X might well be a bicartesian closed category. It's not the kind of thing you normally think about because it's a partially ordered set. Um, it doesn't have this complicated idea of arrow composition, but it still has this amazing structure. And hopefully this is starting to indicate just how powerful these kind of categorical concepts are because we see them appearing in so many different places. Okay, so we have this category here of subsets and we've sort of convinced ourselves that it's a partially ordered set and that it has a terminal object and that it has an initial object and that it has products and that it has co-products. So we really want to see that it's a bicartesian closed category. All right, that's what we're aiming for. So we just need one more thing, which is exponential objects. Does this thing have exponential objects? Well, let me tell you that it does. And let me tell you the notation that we use for an exponential object in a partially ordered set like this. We call it a big arrow B. And doesn't that suggest what kind of thing might be an exponential object? Because basically these are the symbols that we use to mean A implies B. And so how can we kind of set theorize that idea that A implies B? If it was a subset of X, which represented the notion that A implies B, what would it look like? Well, how about the subset of X defined by the feature that anything within that subset, which is in A, must also be in B, okay? So something like this. I've tried to shade all the area with the property that any point in this sort of green area, if it's in A, then it's also in B. So let's try and define this then. We'll define A big arrow B to be the set of elements E of X defined by the feature that if E is in A, then E is in B. So any E which satisfies this property belongs to this subset here. So even these E's which are outside of A altogether, um, they're never in A, so we don't have to meet any conditions. So they're also belonging to this. And um, if you think about how I was describing the idea of implies earlier, you'll see that this is really just exactly the set of elements which have the property that if the element belongs to subset A, in other words, if chi of A is true, then chi of B is true. Or if you like, it's the set of elements E such that chi of A of E implies chi of B of E. And it turns out that this is indeed the kind of exponential object which we're looking for. Um, so let's try and convince ourselves of this. Remember this um, kind of diagram for an exponential object? And the first thing we want is for there to be an evaluation arrow. And if you remember, that arrow should go from b to the power of a times a to b. So what that means in this context is that we want this kind of subset here intersected with a to be contained in B. So imagine getting this kind of green subset here and taking the intersection of it with A. Well, that's just going to give this stuff here, which indeed is gonna be contained in B. So yes, we have our evaluation arrow. The other thing we need is this kind of idea that we can sort of close this triangle. Um, this idea that we can sort of find the transpose of an arrow. Um, so in particular, what we want is that if we have a sort of arrow from D times A to B, in other words, if D intersection A is contained in B, 
then we want to have an arrow like this. And indeed this is the case, because if this holds true, then what it means is that every element which is in D and in A is also in B. And so that means that if we have an element, and so that means if we have an element of D, then either such an element isn't in A, in which case it's in B to the power of A, or such an element is in A, but it's also in B, in which case it's also in B to the power of A. So this indeed holds true. And then because this is a car, and then because we have products, this then implies that we have this sort of arrow like so. And because we're working in a partially ordered set, we know that this diagram commutes and we know that this is the unique arrow, which is such that this is true because we have a partially ordered set. So, so yes, indeed, this posit of subsets does have exponential objects. So this is brilliant. We have uh, terminal objects, initial objects, products, co-products and exponential objects. What we have here is a bicartesian closed category, not just any category, a bipartesian closed posset. And there's a special name for categories like that. They're called hating algebras and they are intimately related to logic. Well, we already know that, right? We, we've already seen how closely related this thing is to logic. But this idea of a hating algebra, which pretty much just means the same thing as a bicartesian closed posset, it's just another kind of uh, equivalent way of saying it. Um, but hating algebras are more general than these kind of posits of subsets. Um, and the thing is that with these posits of subsets, the way we've seen it, we've seen that there's a sort of logic connected to this. We've got at it using our ideas of these kind of indicator functions. And um, we've seen that that logic is classical, right? The idea is that we're basically using true and false. An element is either present within a subset or it's absent, okay, true or false. Um, but there is more, but there are more general kinds of logics than just this classical logic. There's such a thing as intuitionistic logic, which is a really fascinating field where you basically take the normal kind of rules of logic, like for example, A and B implies A, and you take lots of the sort of normal rules of how logic behaves, but you remove this idea that things are simply either true or false. You could kind of consider a more general framework um, where you might have other kinds of truth values and when things can work in different ways. And it turns out that hating algebras are precisely the models for this kind of intuitionistic propositional logic that you can have. And they're also really closely related to some other fascinating ideas to do with category theory. Ideas that I'm not gonna get into in this video, but I have videos on topos theory, and topos theory is really, um, like, in my opinion, it's the best thing if you want to understand about intuitionistic logic because you'll see, I mean, all of the ideas that I've been talking about uh, in this video pretty much are all just the sort of classical versions of what's going on in topos theory. So what I've really been talking about is just sort of the tip of the iceberg in a sense, because I've just been talking about sets and the idea of subsets, but you can generalize all that. So you can think about, you have some kind of a category with a special structure, called a topos, and instead of having subsets, um, instead of having sets with subsets, you have objects with subobjects. And um, when you look at sort of the way that toposes work, they also have a sort of logic connected with them, but it might not be a classical logic. In fact, it's exactly this kind of intuitionistic logic. So 
I'll just say a sort of word for people that know about topos theory. Um, if you have a topos and you have an object, you can always form this sort of partially ordered set of subobjects by containment, just the same kind of idea as here really, but generalized. And you always get a sort of hating algebra, which describes the sort of containment relationships. This kind of poset you get is always a hating algebra. And when you have a hating algebra, you always have, I mean, because it's really defined or can be thought of as a bi-Cartesian closed poset, you always have these ideas of um, initial object, terminal object, products, co-products, exponential object. So you can always really talk about these kind of things, um, which are basically um, looking like things from familiar logic. OK, so um, basically every hating algebra um, is a sort of model of some kind of intuitionistic propositional logic. You're going to have an initial object in your hating algebra. You can think of that as corresponding with the idea of false. You're going to have a terminal object that will correspond with the idea of true. You're going to have products that corresponds with the idea of and. You'll have co-products, which, which give you or. You'll have exponential objects, which give you this idea of kind of A implies B. However, um, if you're working in a general kind of hating algebra, so if you can just cook up some posets, which happens to have all of these nice properties, um, then you will basically have um, a system which might not necessarily be modeling classical logic, but it will be modeling some kind of logic. So hopefully you can see that these kind of ideas, which we've been playing around with, are really, well, okay, it's a bit fanciful language, but I think it's sort of like a warp gate or something. It allows you to get to these really kind of far away places where we have different sorts of logic and all sorts of different things going on. But we can still use our sort of um, increasingly familiar ideas of category theory to understand what's going on. So just to finish, just to give you a very brief um, idea about these kind of non-classical systems. Um, think about this. This is a graph. It has one directed edge and two vertices. What are all the different subgraphs? Well, we might not include that directed edge. We might not include that left vertex. We might not include that right vertex. We might not include either vertex. So these are the different subgraphs. And again, we can order them by containment. So you see, we've drawn these different subgraphs of this and ordered them by containment. So what we're really doing here, we could say we're working in the category of graphs and we have an object for each subobject of this thing here and we're ordering them by containment. And it turns out that this is a hating algebra, but it's not really the kind of classical thing. There is a logic associated with this, but it's a non-classical kind of logic. And if you want to understand more about these kind of ideas, um, you can check out my, and if you want to understand more about these kind of ideas, you can check out my videos on topos theory. But what we're going to be doing, now we have this idea of a hating algebra. This is actually a really great place for us to start thinking about type theory, because we can start thinking about how we can reason within this kind of hating algebra. And it's got a great combination of having these really elegant structures defined within it, but also because it's partially ordered set, everything's pretty simple. And we can come up with a few kind of simple rules for manipulating symbols. And we can really talk very generally about these kind of hating algebras. And as we do it, we're really speaking in a language which is describing all of this kind of intuitionistic propositional logic, which is really this nice kind of generalization of classical logic.